live. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is the Vermont House Committee on Commerce and Economic Development. Uh, this morning, uh, the first hour, we'll be uh, looking at the amendment to S-352 uh, and vote on that. Then we will be looking at uh, S-353 um, with further proposal of amendment, um, looking at that and um, voting that as well. And uh, so um, to begin, we'll have Damien walk us through the final time on the amendment to, H, uh, to S-352 and then uh, uh, S-353. So Damien, if you could. Sure, and I'm actually, I just sent you 353. I'm gonna send you the updated 352 right now, okay. which has just changed the order of uh, sponsors since we talked yesterday. Right. And that will uh, just so people listening in that we will uh, post that on our web page as well so that you can look at it at the same time that we're looking at it. So here we are. Uh, S352, you'll notice uh, Representative Kimball is now the lead sponsor of the amendment, followed by the chair and then the rest of the members of the committee in alphabetical order. The first uh, amendment was to add the traveling nurse agency and the other nurse contracting agencies to the extent that they're providing nurses to other covered employers. Um, and then the cleaning and janitorial service and the food service providers that the Senate added to the extent that they are providing services to healthcare or residential care providers. Um, the second instance of amendment here um, is the uh, change that we discussed yesterday. Uh, this is adding in the provision um, that the uh, $25 or less hourly base wage requirement does not apply to employees of home health agencies and nursing homes, as well as the contract nurses working at the home health, for a home health agency or a nursing home. <clears throat> The third instance of amendment here uh, removed language related to um, an employee receiving a direct payment from the state, uh, electing not to receive the hazard pay because they can simply choose not to apply. The fourth uh, instance of amendment here uh, requires employers to include their former employees. The fifth instance of amendment uh, changes this from saying shall inform the employee that they may elect not to receive a grant to just saying that they're not required to apply for a grant. Um, and then the sixth instance of amendment here complements the requirement that employers identify former employees um, by getting rid of the words may identify and instead replacing requesting that the employer or saying requesting that it identify those former employees. And that is it. Are there questions on the language? I believe Representative Christie has found that you doubled um, Representative Kimball twice in the sponsorship. Oh dear. And Representative Christie is absolutely right. I will correct that and resend. Okay. Any other questions? for Damien on this before we um, move to vote. Okay, seeing none, I would. Mike, I, see yep. I am omitted from that list as well. Stephanie's not on it. Oh, thank you. Uh, and, and just for and just See for that? clarification, uh, um, Representative Morris, not Christie, because I know we have a Representative Christie in another uh, district. <clears throat> All right. And, oh, geez, yeah, we've got a couple of them. See, we get there. So everybody get, check to make sure you're on the list. We got two <laughs> Charlies for one Stephanie. I appreciate that you um, you updated my name on there, Damien. So thank you for that attention to detail. I'm very grateful. The uh, <laughs> the um, computer program did it for me, so I can't claim any credit. Um, 
That would be our excellent editorial uh, staff here. So, and okay, let's see, we've got to get Representative Morris in here. I, I apologize for that. Um, the good news is the other one is a committee report. So there's no chance for me to, to accidentally leave people off the list. Not a problem, Damien. Okay. Okay. So again, are, um, any, anything else that anybody sees? Uh, any comments, any questions? Okay, seeing none, I think we can go, uh, Zach? Sorry, um, Mike, I'm, I'm just, uh, just before we vote, I was, um, this kind of goes back a couple steps, um, but I was, uh, I can't remember if we had a discussion about ambulance workers that don't work for municipalities. As when, I'm just trying to think about who we might have left out. You know, Maybe. most uh, most ambulance services are private, privately contracted. Um, so I, they I were, yeah, they were covered in 965. Okay, all right, cool. Just, uh, just <laughs> last thing. Yeah, anything else? Okay, I would entertain a motion to report favorably on the amendment to uh, S352. I'll motion. I'll second. So I, that was moved by Representative Watson and seconded by Representative O'Sullivan. Why, well, yes, it was. Any further discussion? If not, the clerk can commence to call the roll and she is ready. This is S-352, the amendment to S-352 is the official title of this? Correct. Amendment. Okay. It's the Kimball amendment to S-352. Okay, thank you. Okay. Representative Bancroft. Yes. Representative Bach. Yes. Representative Carroll. Yes. Representative Dickinson. Representative Jerome, yes. Representative Kimball. Representative Marcotte. Yes. Representative Morris. Yes. Representative O'Sullivan. Yes. Representative Tolino. Yes. And Representative Watson. Yes. Okay. Okay, so let's hold that open. Um, when Charlie and uh, Lynn join us, then um, we can ask them okay. for their votes. So thank you, committee. Uh, Charlie will be taking care of the amendment as well as the, the main bill. And so now let's switch gears and look at um, S353 and look at the changes there. So Damien, did we hear back from A&R? Um, do we know if there's any private um, water system, sewer system businesses out there? Yes, sorry, I was uh, just unmuting. I just heard back from them uh, this morning. Let me stop the screen share so that I don't show my email inbox. Um, so the response from uh, Amy Palaxic at um, ANR was uh, to Michael O'Grady from our office is we have very few facilities that meet that criteria. Most notably, however, is Global Foundries, which commingles their industrial and sanitary wastewater during treatment. However, this is an exception rather than the rule. The majority of private industrial facilities keep sanitary and industrial wastewater separate. Um, so in other words, um, the private facilities are primarily tied to industry um, and are 
generally treating the industrial wastewater and letting the sanitary wastewater go to a public facility. Um, the exception is global foundries um, and possibly a few others, um, but in most cases, not so. Our bill covers um, uh, septic service providers, um, but it does not currently cover a private waste treatment facility. Uh, we know at public wastewater facilities serving like a, um, some of the cities and towns around Vermont, um, that there have been instances where they've found COVID-19 in the water that they're treating. Um, it's, I mean, I, I can't say whether that's a similar concern at Global Foundries right now um, or, or another private wastewater treatment facility. The issue was just raised, um, was not raised by uh, an employer or employee at one of these facilities. It was raised by AHS as, um, or um, a, as a potential, did we, did we forget this um, issue? So it was more of a question of, should these folks be included or not? Um, the septic services were meant to be included in it. We've now clarified that. Um, but this, this is a different group. So, um, committee, what is your pleasure? Would you like to just add language in just in case there's some private wastewater treatment facilities out there that are, that would fall uh, into this? Christy? Yeah, uh, just, just a, a point of clarification. We have, a. A mobile home park in town it's, it's it's well out of town it's not connected to the municipal system and they have a a, a wastewater collection pool uh, i don't know if it's treated beyond that uh, and so that brought up the question with the private um, uh, sewage treatment is it just is it just like the the septic service or um, do they actually have to treat it and maintain it I, i'm just uh, just a point of clarification so it's the septic service provider. So the um, the in in most cases, my understanding is that a septic service provider will um, will go to the location. They'll empty the septic tank, yeah. um, and then they'll deliver it to a municipal wastewater facility like yeah. the one in Montclair uh, that takes outside waste, and it'll get treated there. Um, during the two month period that we're talking about here, um, the, they were not doing that except in emergencies, uh, such as an overflowing tank, um, or a, a failed septic system that was putting effluent on the ground. Um, so that, that I think is, is something that's important, to, to note in this, um, but I think for, for purposes of, of that mobile home park that you're describing, it would be the septic service that's actually going out there and pumping it to the extent that they had to um, that we're covering right now. Um, so one of the things that struck me or is striking me now as I think about this is um, just the language around elevated risk. Yeah, so I, th I think they would be covered um, because it, the, the language is, has a high potential for exposure to known or suspected sources of COVID-19, including through providing in-person care or cleaning or sanitizing the premises of a covered employer. Um, but that's a non, when we say including, it's not a, an exclusive um, list. So if it's a known source of COVID-19, such as septic, um, I think that you've got, you've got that covered. Um, but yeah, so the, the bottom line though, um, Representative Morris, is that um, your the septic service that goes out there to empty that 
um, and treat that tank should be covered. The only thing that we have a question about here is does a private wastewater treatment employee get covered or not? Um, and they are not currently covered. And all of the public employees are excluded anyway, just by nature of being a public employee. So committee, what would you like to do? Would you like to just include them just in case? Uh, it's not gonna do any harm if we don't, if we do include them and there isn't any, um, but it could be harmful to a few people if there are some and they would be excluded from receiving any hazard pay. I think it's a good idea. Yeah, if there's no harm, let's do it. Yeah. I, th I feel the same. Okay, yep. let's include them uh, in the language, Damien, just in case. Okay. Uh, Zach, see. question? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I was uh, just looking over the list and, and a thought occurred. Um, so uh, the, the pharmacy in Woodstock is, uh, is closing. It made me think about industries that would be eligible employers um, who have actually closed um, since uh, because of the pandemic and are no longer in service. And uh, do we have a mechanism for getting their employees this hazard pay? I don't know how many employees there are, but I know there is this one in Woodstock and I'm sure they're not alone that's closed, uh, closing or closed because of the pandemic and not reopening. I thought that was in the wording of the bill that they had to be open uh, in the original context of the bill. Open, but then the went out of business is what I'm saying. Sorry, not closed. I'm um, you're mixing those. Um, so they were open during the period and have since gone out of business. Is there anything in there, Damien, that deals with that issue? Um, so that that's actually a interesting issue that we hadn't considered. Um, the the way it's set up is it should go through the employer's payroll. So if the employer no longer exists or has payroll, um, they wouldn't be able to apply under the regular uh, program. However, with the new language allowing people to identify former employees. Uh, conceivably, an employer who's in the, the process of dissolving their business and no longer has employees could file an application identifying their former employees uh, with no current employees identified, and then the state could reach out to those individuals um, and ask them if they want to apply for a grant. So I think with the changes in S-352 that the Senate added, um, to allow former employees to get the grants, that situation would be covered provided the employer is existence or in existence to the point where they would actually file an application. Um, we we do still have the issue of if that employer is for whatever reason um, left the state completely or or is not willing to file the application, those employees wouldn't be able to recover. Um, uh, or receive a grant through the program because um, they wouldn't have been identified. Um, and even if there was an individual application, we'd still have the issue because if there's no employer to actually verify that they were performing the work, um, the you, you still wouldn't be able to get certified. So that's the, the start with the employer verification process that the individuals were, were performing covered work. Um, so there, I guess the answer is maybe um, under the existing language. So, uh, I, I think this kind of, um, uh, and this was not intentional, I swear that I was just thinking about it, you know, um, because the Woodstock Pharmacy was in the headlines recently, but it does, it, I do wonder if this again makes adds to the argument that there needs to be some sort of mechanism for individual employees to be able to somehow 
trigger something that they can be included in this. I, I don't know how many people that is. And so, and I think it's probably gonna be pretty difficult to estimate, but if we can come up with some sort of low bureaucratic way of at least triggering some sort of process. Yeah, one of the that. challenges that we have is that, um, and this gets back to coverage under the, the CRF dollars, is we need to be able to demonstrate that there's a link to COVID-19. Um, and so one of, one of the ways to do that is to have some sort of certification process, which is somewhat easily verifiable. Um, and so Pennsylvania and we have decided to do it and New Hampshire um, have decided to do hazard pay programs where the employer lists the employees, whether they're in this case, whether they're currently employed or not, because that shortcuts the state having to follow up with the employer to process the application or having the employee have to track down their former employer. Louisiana did it the other way where people had to file an application that their employer had signed off on. Um, but they still, they still had to get their employer to sign off. Um, and so that's, that's again, the challenge with uh, a business that has gone under. Um, there's no one there to sign the paperwork to certify. You're relying on employees self-certifying um, which, and in, in an ideal world, we could de depend on people not to file a fraudulent application. Um, but by having some sort of second check, you reduce the, the potential for fraud on these applications. Um, and so that's, I'm not saying that it, it's a good idea or a bad idea. I'm just pointing out one of the issues with that. COVID dollars is we need to be able to demonstrate that link and this is an easy way to do it. Um, it starts to get more difficult when there's a self-certification process. UI um, has been dealing with this too, but they're, they do their investigations on the back end using a whole bunch of tools that the Federal Department of Labor provides them to help track down whether people are filing claims in multiple states or reporting wages or that sort of thing during this time period that they didn't put on their UI application. Um, I don't know that our agency of human services um, could manage to do that. Um, so it, it just, it's a, an issue that the committee would want to consider if you go forward on that. Um, Again, it, it doesn't provide a lot of help to these folks that you're talking about unless their employer um, can somehow be there to certify. Charlie? Seeing in this specific case that um, Representative Watson brings up that company will not cease to exist uh, after it is, um, it is negotiating the sale of its customer base list to another pharmacy. Um, so that actual business will not cease to exist in its corporate structure. So they could still apply for hazard pay for their employees um, that were working during the covered period. Um, so that is definitely possible even with that particular thing. And then there's a question about successor employers. Um, so if somebody buys a business um, and the trade name and everything else and operates as a business name, then they are subject to certainly a lot of things for unemployment insurance, workers' comp, and everything else as a successor business. So would they also be eligible then to apply? I, probably the case could be made that a successor business could apply for hazard pay for those employees from the previous business that they bought. So I, I think there's probably avenues that they could pursue without trying to anticipate other instances like that in the bill. I, I guess that does, I mean, that makes sense. I am, you know, for these successor businesses though, how can they attest that the employee was subject to these conditions if they weren't the employer at the time? It, and, you know, I, I also, you know, when we have the employer itself, um, 
a testing, there is some, you know, it is a double check, but, uh, the, uh, but the employer is self attesting for themselves in some cases. Um, I, you know, I, I think we, I wonder if we could insert language that, that the individual employee could reach out or have their own specific application where then the human services goes and tries to verify the information with the, um, the person that was, that is listed as the owner of the business that had closed down or was in, uh, was operating at the time. And they can verify directly with that, with the form, with the former owner of the business. Um, if we're looking for that backstop there. I, th I, I think no matter what the, it's the business that is the verifier. And so if a business has already uh, put claims in and um, they've had these people that have left and weren't part of the, the initial put through and the business is closing down or closing, I think they still have the ability to try to touch base with them. But I don't think that we have or AHS has time to um, they're going to reach out to them anyway. I think in the language that we have, they will be reaching out to those businesses um, for um, to see if they have any employees that were left off because they left employment. Um, so I think that's going to be done anyway. I don't know that we can make any more changes that are going to help people. I don't know. Just thinking at this late time now, we're getting down to nitty gritty and, and the more we keep digging, the more small issues that we can continue to find. And then we wind up holding this thing up. And also, Mr. Mr. Chair, it's, it's a voluntary program. Right. We're not mandating that employers do this for their employees. So that that if we go down that road, then we're going to go down the other road. And do we then make it a mandatory program for all employers to do that? And since we're giving employers the choice of whether they, they want to apply for hazard pay for their employees, I think that sort of I think I think by making that choice, um, there, there, we know that some people will get left out. Hopefully not, but there is a possibility there. So I guess I'll leave it up to the committee. Do you want to continue to let's see if we can get some language to fix this? Or are you satisfied that, that um, where, we're, where we're at now is a good place? I'm good where we are. Me too. Me too. Mm -hmm. I'm good. I, I'm good. It's going to be hard to capture 100% of everybody. Um, time is of the essence, I think. Happy to accept uh, the committee's um, thoughts on this. I do just want to, you know, that the reason we're doing this is we are trying to get money to employers, uh, sorry, employees who, you know, were working during exceptional times um, to provide service to Vermonters who needed it. And the way that it's currently designed, that is contingent upon the employer's interest in actually doing this. We are going to leave people out. And those people that are left out are people that did, did are just as eligible for this money as everybody else. And we're not giving them any means at all uh, for them to uh, to contest that or or to raise their hand and say, you know, I, I deserve this money too. Um, so we're going to be the people that we do leave out. Um, you know, we're <laughs> it's it's for no good reason except that we don't have the bureaucratic capacity to actually handle it. When I think there there could potentially we haven't even explored whether there is a simple solution for just an online form to say, hey, I think I'm eligible for this. Can you check with my employer? Um, I, and, you know, I, I know we have until December to do this, but um, 
we actually haven't even explored what type of options there are, but we are going to be leaving people out and those people are eligible just as much as everybody else. So, um, but I'm, I am at the will of the committee. Stephanie. Um, I appreciate what you're saying, uh, Zach, but I, um, in my mind, even if a business had gone is no longer functioning that uh, what we do want is a former employer to verify that they were an employee at that time and to process the paperwork. So it'd be the, on the goodwill of the business to make sure that these people um, could receive this hazard pay. Am I correct? That the, that the business, even though the business was no longer, uh, the doors were no longer open, that the owner of that business, even though it's been closed, could still verify that this person was an employee and could put, could still process this paperwork. They could, so long as, as um, they're able to be found. Okay, so I mean, it's been a short time. Um, you know, if they had closed, say in this case, this pharmacy. Well, I, I guess the other question is, do we even know that there are employees there that that were working and then left employment and got left out. We don't even know that. It's a possibility. Yeah, I guess you know, thinking as a you know as a business owner, I, I you know I care about my employees and I would want to make sure that if I was no longer in business, that I still would want to make sure that my employees could get this benefit. And I I don't see how they would be left out in the current situation if the if the employer. I wanted to do the right thing. I think uh, other things that are going to happen also with this, no matter what, is that there's going to be employees out there that um, feel they've been left out, but don't fall into the, the criteria of being a frontline worker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, if we open it up to allowing um, anybody that feels like they've been left out, um, I think the agency is going to get overwhelmed with people thinking that they should be, be getting it when they don't meet the criteria. So that's a, that's a, I think a drawback, but so I think we're, we're, the committee is, is okay with the design we have now and I appreciate what Zach has brought and, 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 and there is a possibility that that might happen. Um, although I think it's kind of, it's pretty low, but it could, but there's other, other areas too. I think that some people will get missed and unfortunate as it is. Um, I don't think we can have a hundred percent guarantee that everybody will get what they deserve as much as we want them to. Um, so, Damien, if you could walk us through the language. All right. Uh, sure. I'm making changes on the fly right now. Okay. I've just been going back and forth with Mike O'Grady to get the language right on the privately operated. Uh, okay. Uh, hold on. Water pollution control and abatement facility, I think, is the correct term. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, the new language is, uh, would add an operator of a privately owned water pollution abatement and control facility, um, provided that such an employer shall only be permitted to receive a grant to provide hazard pay, uh, to its eligible employees who performed, uh, work uh, performed work in the water pollution abatement and control facility. Um, 
sorry, I don't have this up on the screen. I'm I'm literally typing as as we talk. Okay, Charlie. Mr. Chair, I'm just wondering, um, as you had brought up before, is the, the number of people, number of entities that may own a facility is very small, but there are others that provide services to those facilities. Are we thinking about trying to include those folks that may have a water testing service or um, a testing application for those types of facilities. They are not covered under that definition that you just read, right? So it's either the owner of a facility or the provider of that service. Yeah, so it's the employees of someone who owns and operates such a facility. That's where we, I mean, we get into trouble trying to, I mean, it gets complicated the more we try to specify as to who's covered and who's not, but it's, I just bring that up is that if if our intent is to cover people that are providing services to that facility, this don't do it. Right. Yeah, I know it gets back in that whole thing about either they're an employee of that entity or they are contracted out. I just bring that up as a point, and if, if it's not our intent to cover that group, that's fine. Uh, but if it is, then this don't, doesn't do it. Lynn? Are you talking about labs that test water and, you know, all of those private entities that are actually more plentiful than just the private wastewater treatment plant type people? Yeah, that's what I was that's what I was talking about. Right. That's the same reaction I had. So the private testing facilities that that even public wastewater treatment plants may use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Every realtor that sells a house gets a water sample tested or something like that. It's a, I mean, it goes up, this becomes, I mean, where they, where they, they must've been testing water. They have to test water and sewer and all those things during the course of this time. Well, I think the, the real estate was closed. Yeah. I don't know when they were allowed to go back selling again, but I think they were not, they were not part of the essential businesses that re needed to remain open. So it's it's also worth noting too that um, you're you're looking at two different things here. One is uh, dealing with sewage effluent, so um, versus when you're testing water uh, at a house, you're looking at water or or tap water from the municipal taps which presumably has been filtered and treated. Yeah. Um, or well. well. Well, well water, yeah. I mean, presumably isn't exposed. Um, the exception, a shallow well, which is supposed to be heavily treated um, before it gets to the house. Um, but you're likely to have a whole bunch of other stuff in there rather than the virus um, if it's not treated. So the, the issue with the virus being found has been in wastewater treatment plants. It's not been in, in clean water systems coming into the house. Right. It's because if everybody, you know, uses uh, or produces wastewater, whether you're sick or not. Right. It comes to the and, gathering point. Yeah. So once, I mean, once it's been treated, they haven't found COVID in treated, the treated water, correct? It's, it's pre-treated where they found um, COVID? I'm, I'm not the, the person who could answer this, but what I'm aware of is that they've found it in untreated septage. Okay. Right. You know, the, the, the municipal wastewater treatments have their own lab. There's someone who works in that lab that works uh, and tests things. They're not necessarily testing for COVID, although now apparently they are, or somebody's testing it, but they have their own lab. Um, and the, the community, I think you might be talking about like community uh, water and sewer for some developments. There's some that had community systems. They're, they probably have to test it anyway to stay viable for the community they serve. The right, so they, they have to test for drinking water quality. 
Um, and then they probably have to, um, whatever their system is, whether it's community septic or something <laughs> like that, they'll need to get that permitted ahead of time. Yeah. They'll need to have it maintained. And that's the septic services that we've already got covered. Um, I, said, I think we're pretty well covered. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that yep. we didn't think of, yeah, thanks. Okay, so are we ready to take a stab at the language that we have so that um, within the next 10 minutes or so we could possibly have a vote? All right, I'm sending that draft to our editors just to review. Yep. Do you want me to show, uh, share an unedited copy on the screen? Yeah, that would be great, Damien. Thank you. Let me go ahead and um, do that. It's just taking a moment for everything to move around because I can't be in the document while the editors are trying to review it. So I have to get in and out very quickly and then put it in a PDF for the committee to see. Okay. So apologize for the delays here. So I guess while we're waiting for Damien, um, uh, Stephanie, why don't you get Charlie and Lynn's vote on uh, the amendment to S-352? So far, everyone has voted in the positive. So it's to report favorably on the amendment to S-352. Okay, Representative Dickinson. Now oh, this is the Kindle Amendment. Kimball Amendment. This is the Kimball yes. Amendment yeah. to yes. 352. Yes. Okay, and uh, Representative Kimball, how do you vote? Mm -hmm. Yes. Very good, 11 zero, zero. Okay. It'd be interesting to report on your <laughs> amendment. <laughs> you know, yes. Let me tell you why I don't support my amendment. <laughs> <laughs> not not to confuse the matter, but did you check with the other member, uh, the other Kimball member from Woodstock, since there were two originally on the draft? <laughs> um, uh, you get this. You finally get to split yourself, Charlie, on both sides of the issue. I was I was just beside myself, Tristan. <laughs> oh, okay. okay, I'm gonna share my screen now. And I'll send this to uh, the clerk's office. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, here's the updated uh, version of the amendment. It's a committee report, so we don't have to worry about me making a mistake with names again. Um, so uh, again, just a little bit of a terminology change at the front because we've gone to those providing essential services to Vermonters. As we discussed yesterday, the uh, guidance is still not uh, not clear on this, but uh, it seems to be indicating and, and experience from other states seem to indicate, uh, at least to me, that um, the providing grants for hazard pay to private employers uh, is now a little bit safer on that continuum of risk than it was when we considered this issue in June. Um, 
the uh, changes here. We've done some renumbering because of our S-352 amendment. And then the big change today is to add the language that's highlighted here. Um, we also added the or septic service language on the line above it. So, uh, I read this language to you. Are there any questions or concerns about it now that you're seeing it in front of you? Christy? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Damien, just in reading this um, and listening to our previous conversation, the septic service providers are excluded from this or included? They're included on the, the line above, line five, um, little 21 in the Roman numerals, trash collection, waste management, or septic. There you go. Thank you. I, is my oversight. Thank you. Yep. No, that's, that's fine. Um, it, the reason I have the other language highlighted is because our editors already reviewed the septic service language. This is for their benefit. Um, and then I've renumbered the remaining sections here. Um, and again, this only changes section one of uh, S-353. And then in section two, we've changed the appropriation amount from 19 and a half million down to 12 and a half million to reflect what was in the big bill when it passed the house. Um, and I believe um, that we're going to let the appropriations committee figure out if there's another 7 million available somewhere. Correct. Correct. <clears throat> okay. Any further discussion, clarifications, uh, questions on S-353 has further amended? Is everyone comfortable voting for S-353 prior to it coming back from the editors? Mm -hmm. Or would you like to wait for the editors to, the edited version to come back? Do we know how long that would take? I know the editor is looking at it right now, um, but I, I don't know beyond that. So generally they let me know when they've got it and then they let me know when they're done. Okay. Christy, did you have any other? Um, I, we, I neglected to, to lower my hand, but that I, I just, and just thinking about Representative Watson's uh, request and, and, and I know we talked about it and we, we decided, but I, I'm wondering if uh, if we included the language at, uh, that I'm, I'm trying to understand if that were um, that were employed during the period that we're talking about, if that would give the opportunity for an, a former employer or a closed business employer to to try to apply. I just I, I you know, I, I commented on it and, and uh, excluded it the first time, but it, it, it makes you think. And I'm just, I'm, I just want to be comfortable that uh, th this is the direction that we want to go. And, and I know other other uh, amendments, other bills have said that the, they needed to be employed during that time period. Um, I mean, what if what if they closed next week? Um, then those businesses would not be, in, those employers, those employees would not be included. That, that's so, not, not accurate. So okay. the, the employees had to be employed during the period from March 13th to May 15th, which is the period in the bill. Uh, the employer the way the existing law is, is it says they have to be currently employed, which does create a problem for business that's gone under or had to lay off employees. The bill that came over from the Senate on S-352 corrected that by allowing uh, employers to seek the benefit for former employees too by identifying them and then allowing the state to 
send them an application. Um, the, we've clarified that here to make that a requirement so it's not optional for the employer to identify the former employees mm -hmm. um, and then to affirmatively uh, have the state request that employers who have already applied send that application. Um, as Representative Kimball was talking about, if an employer is going under at this point or has gone under, um, they could still potentially, as a going business, identify their former employees with the change that uh, has been put in with the House and then um, further clarified by this committee. So it's still possible for them to do that. There's no guarantee, though, if it's a, a small business, they struggle with closing down the business, maybe such that they choose not to do it, but they still have that option. Okay. Anything else? Okay, I would entertain a motion to report favorably on S353 with further proposal of amendment. So moved, now what the chairman said. Okay. Representative Morris has moved. Is there a second? I'll second. And by Representative O'Sullivan. Okay, is there any other discussion? Seeing none, the clerk can commence to call the roll when she's ready. This is the hazard pay amendment. This is S-353 um, with further proposal of amendment. Reporting favorably on S-353 with further proposal of amendment. Okay. Representative Bancroft? Yes. Representative Bach? Yes. Representative Carroll? Uh, Representative Dickinson? Yes. Representative Jerome? Yes. Representative Kimball? Yes. Representative Marcotte? Yes. Representative Morris? Yes. Representative O'Sullivan? Yes. Representative Tolino? Yes. Representative Watson? Yes. Okay, 1100. Oh, just a moment. Representative Mark Carroll? Oh, that's right. Jim didn't jump on. Are you there, Jim? If you are, you're muted. Yes, sir. Uh, Representative Carroll? Did you hear me? No. Did you, did you hear me? No. Stephanie, did you hear me? I, I can hear you now. Um, do you vote yes on? Yes. No? Okay. Thank you, Representative Carroll. Okay. So 1100 reporting favorably with further proposal of amendment on S353. Um, I need a reporter. Hmm. I'll take a stab at it, Stephanie. I'll do it, yeah. Okay. Um, appropriations will want to see you and Charlie at nine o'clock tomorrow morning um, to go over those amendments. And I'll let Teresa know that um, that you will be reporting the bill. And so she'll send you a, a Zoom invite along with Charlie. Thank you very much. Thank you, committee. Um, I think it's great that we're we're able to provide uh, provide this for our for our uh, frontline workers that were out there taking care of us. So it's a good job. So with that, um, Damien, thank you very much. Um, You're welcome. I'll send the uh, edited clean draft as soon as it's finished.
Okay. Yeah. Send it to Stephanie and, um, and she'll get it to the uh, clerk's office. I think the speaker will probably want to move that, take it off and move it to appropriations today. Okay. Sounds good. Good. Thanks. And I know you want it in other places. So yeah, thanks okay. for your work. Okay. Well, now we'll switch gears. Um, good morning, Heather. Thank you for joining us. Morning. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think we we've heard uh, a lot of news on the rollout of the uh, thirty dollar um, voucher programs, consumer stimulus program that happened last week, and I just asked you to come in and and give us a report. There are some members from appropriations who are interested in in the report as well, and so they're joining us. Uh, Chair Toll and and Vice Chair uh, Hooper and and others are are with us. And uh, so we look forward to hearing your report. Thank you for coming. Great, well, I really appreciate the opportunity to give folks an update. Um, I did provide yesterday afternoon a link to the status report that we've put together. I don't know if, if members have had a chance to look at that, um, but uh, there's some complete details in there that I will go over, but I think the highlights is that, you know, when the program launched, we had over a thousand businesses fully enrolled and approved of those uh, in that status at launch, 93% uh, of them saw business directly from this initial pilot program. Uh, we've had over and with so that was on the business side in terms of Consumers, we had about 12,000 consumers, uh, Vermonters, who were able to sign up for the program. Um, in terms of the types of redemption in the first week, we were now up to about 1,800 offers redeemed. And we are seeing the type of additional economic activity that we're hoping for from the stimulus. Right now, the overspend is about at 53%. Um, so, you know, in the first week, we've already injected an additional $25,000 into the economy on top of the value of the discounts. Um, these numbers are, are all in that report um, that I forwarded, as well as the breakdown of funds. Um, so we were able to distribute this economic activity throughout all, team, all 14 counties of the state. Uh, we do have breakdowns of the number of businesses who received funds, both by county as well as by sector. Um, if you may recall, when we set up the program parameters, we did want to target this stimulus to those sectors that really have been the hardest hit by this pandemic. And so um, you'll see in the reporting that more of the stimulus went to retail and restaurants um, as we had designed the program, um, as well as you'll see that when you look at the average amount that went to different types of businesses, lodging is much higher than the others um, because the amount of stimulus to lodging was larger. So. I can explain that a little bit more. The average gift was $30, um, but we know that some higher ticket items, you need a little bit more of, of an incentive to, to take the plunge to make that purchase. So for lodging, the stimulus amount was actually $150. Um, we do have some great testimonials in the report as well in terms of what this has meant to local businesses. Just thinking about lodging, there's one in particular from, from a lodging operator in Stowe who with, you know, with one, $150 stimulus, you know, they had somebody book a four night stay and it's just kind of over the moon about it. Um, so it's really great to hear those specific anecdotes as well as the hard data. Um, so I can just kind of go over in terms of the sectors, the, the funds for business that we saw from it in retail average to $373 for restaurants, $378 for lodging, $1595. Health and Wellness 285 and Entertainment Attractions 476, all leading up to an average of 470, excuse me, $436 per business. Um, well, you know, the complete amount of the stimulus was distributed, as, as everyone knows, that the, the, the interest was, was fast and furious. Um, so all of those funds have now been allocated to the different businesses and Consumers now have until the end of October to go ahead and uh, receive those discounts. And again, we hope they will spend more and we'll continue to see the additional economic activity that this pilot generated. Um, and through this reporting mechanism we have, we will still continue to get updated data as the project rolls out. Um, 
that's the kind of really high level in terms of what we've seen so far. So if there are questions or you'd like me to go into any more detail, any parts of that, I'd be happy to do so. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Heather, how, how were um, businesses chosen um, or how did you filter out businesses that had um, no issues with COVID um, opposed to the businesses that were really struck hard by, by COVID? Sure. Um, so we did, it was, an, it was an open sign up in the sense that we tried to get the word out as much as possible in terms of businesses who were interested in participating. Um, and then we did have a couple of parameters, though we did follow the, the guidelines for other federal funding. There were a few um, uh, you know, restrictions, in, for instance, for firearms, cannabis, alcohol. Some of those things are typically restricted from federal funds. I know we've sp spoken about before, we're, we're not eligible for this. Um, also, these businesses had to be Vermont owned and operated so that national franchises were not eligible for the program. There was also an attestation that's part of the sign-up process that businesses had to attest that they were, did suffer financial harm due to the COVID emergency. Um, again, following other attestations that we've done in other uh, relief programs like this. And, and each business through the sign-up process was contacted individually so that, you know, human to human talking to each other, this wasn't just, um, you know, through cyberspace to make sure that the business understood the program, that they understood the eligibility rules. Um, and as I mentioned, we had just over a thousand businesses who had gone through that whole process at launch. We've had since then another 600 businesses who have expressed interest. Um, they would love to participate should this be expanded. Okay, questions for Heather? Charlie? Hi, Heather, just a couple of questions. Um, in looking at the value of the vouchers or certificates that could be redeemed, anywhere from 10 to $150. I think when we first reviewed this, it was a minimum 30 is how it was presented to us, a minimum $30. And I don't think we fully understood that some could get a maximum of $150. So I'm wondering a couple of things. When somebody uh, signed up for the program, did they have the option of signing up for $150 worth of total certificates that could be issued? Uh, did they have an option of only $30? So can you explain to us how that actually works so that some people got $150 certificates or vouchers and some people got $10? Sure. Uh, you know, the, the voucher levels are based on, you know, industry research in terms of what it takes to incentivize additional purchases. So, you know, there were some $10 certificates in there for fast food casual restaurants. Um, and as we've just talked about, the higher amount for lodging. Um, you know, when somebody is presented with, when they participate, when they show interest in participating in the program, they're able to pick the different areas they might be interested in. So only those who chose lodging um, would have seen that higher amount. So it wasn't as if you were, you, you choose what you're interested in first before the amount of the discount. Okay, so if you did not choose lodging, you wouldn't have the opportunity to qualify for $150 certificate or that total value. So if you only expressed your interest in coffee shops, then your options would be limited to those lower value certificates. Is that right? That's correct. And I, and I think that the, the, the way to think of this is, is that this is really a program designed to give economic relief to businesses. And so the equity that we achieved was how, what was available across different businesses to help in their long-term sustainability. And so yes, different consumers did receive different discount offers, but what we were really trying to balance is to make sure that the economic help that we were providing was, was distributed across sectors you know, given to their loss and the lodging sector has suffered tremendously. And so that's why that higher amount was directed to them um, and across geographically based on population density. So we, you know, there's only so many factors that we can control. And this whole program has really been about helping our businesses survive, you know, encouraging folks to shop locally. Um, but that's why there was the higher amount for lodging in this pilot program. And I, I can appreciate that. And I think from a marketing tool perspective where you're trying to match up interested customers with potential service providers or sellers, it's a very good matching as to whether or not it meets the 
um, equality or across the people that are receiving that incentive from a consumer standpoint, that that's problematic. I just guess the second point is the one thing I wanted to ask is, do you have any data on the profile, the types of people that were deeming the coupons or that are signed up for the program? Do we know how, wh where they are demographically, how old they are, what their income levels are or that kind of stuff? Do we know if they are in need or not in need of an additional stimulus themselves? No, we're not collecting, you know, personally identifiable information like that. This is, you know, we wanted this to be a, a low barrier. Um, we're really looking at how much additional economic activity we can generate by these purchasing decisions. You know, so we're not acting, we're not asking those types of questions from the folks who sign up. You know, and, and the reason, you know, the reason why uh, the higher amount for lodging is that if we only provided a $30 incentive to lodging, um, you know, other programs like this have shown that that would not incentivize people to choose that lodging deal. And thus those lodging operators would not receive the benefit from the program. So those are the those are the things that we're trying to balance here, right? And I guess it's been painted for some folks, um, in, I don't want to say in the press, but in conversations about this is really good for consumers, and um, we lose that uh, kind of argument when we talk about it's not really providing consumers that need the assistance, uh, and the fact that we can't differentiate within this, we lose that ability to say that. Well, I think that, you know, this is a, I see it as a win-win for consumers and businesses. You know, it, this is a, it, this is about helping businesses survive by encouraging folks to support their local businesses. Um, and, you know, whether someone, I, I think it's okay that folks that, you know, are in need were eligible to this and folks that maybe had more disposable income were eligible for this, for this as well. I mean, the, the fact is they're, they're participating with their local businesses. Um, and that's really what we're trying to do, that this was not meant as a, you know, financial assistance for individuals. I think that's a benefit in the sense that we had it open to everybody who could participate, but it was really always designed to make sure that the, that the aid helped the businesses per the CARES Act funding guidelines that we're really trying to support those businesses that have suffered so much. Okay, thank you. That makes it clearer. For sure, thank you. Katie? Uh, thank you, Mike. I just have a couple of questions, Heather. Um, so the, the, the vouchers that were uh, allotted to individuals, if they weren't based on a total amount that one individual could receive, was it based on a number of vouchers? Like if I went in, was what was, was would I be limited to one or two, or did it vary depending on the category I picked? So most consumers would, would have received at most probably one because the average gift amount was $30. So if you chose a $10 one, you might have, you would, if there was still some left, you could be offered a second $10 gift. But for most everybody, you know, this was a small pool. This was not, you know, a huge amount of money. You know, they had one chance to kind of choose a gift. Um, and so there, it wasn't set as a certain amount per consumer. It was set to, to divide the uh, total amount of funding available amongst as many businesses as possible based on the sectors that they were in. So it wasn't possible for one individual to get two of the $150 vouchers? No. And then my next question, if this were to continue, now that individuals know, well, I took the $10 and I could have gotten 150 and taken my family somewhere, do you think it's going to now skew people to choose certain businesses over others since it's based on what you choose and not the amount of money. So the, should this program continue, there's, we have the opportunity to reset a lot of these different um, kind of parameters that we set up in this pilot. You know, so um, one of the things that we can do, and this is conversations that we did have with the Senate when they were considering this proposal, was if we were to set you know, again, if we were to kind of flip it and say like, well, instead of thinking about the number of businesses and how we divide it that way, if we were to say, this is a certain population and we want them to receive this exact benefit. So let's take a hundred dollars. We can set up the program that way. It's just set up a little bit differently that then the customer would have an account that they would then pull down on that. 
um, that they could put, pick multiple offers. We did also talk to the Senate. They were interested, especially if this was targeted to lower income folks, you know, what if they wanted to spend it all in one place? You know, so that is also a possibility um, if this program goes forward that they could choose to use their entire, you know, say it's, we were talking upwards of, of maybe $400 um, mm -hmm. if this went to the population of those in front monitors or who are unemployed or on pandemic unemployment assistance. So if it was $400, we could set up the program that they could use it all in one place, um, perhaps to allow them to purchase a higher ticket item that they didn't have access to, or they could spread that across different businesses if they, you know, depending on what their needs were. So we do have that ability mm -hmm. in the pilot program. This, you know, this was how it was kind of pitched to us. As you recall, we, we had a competitive RFP process to set this program up and and it was based, that gift amount was based on, you know, how it's performed in other markets. Um, but we definitely have the ability to change those types of things going forward. Thank you, Heather. Mike, I did have two other questions, but if there's other people with their hands up, I don't want to monopolize. Go ahead, keep going, Kitty. There's no other hands up. So I, I just had two other questions, and I think other members around the table heard from constituents as well about the equity piece. You know, I live where, you know, we, I don't have very good service or some people don't even have computers or compute, you know, any computer access. And if some people were at work that day, the money went out very, very quickly that, you know, they didn't have the option to even weigh in. So there seemed to be an equity issue that I think would need to be considered going forward, especially leaving out pools of Vermonters who, who don't have access. And my other question, uh, my second one, and you can answer them in any order are, is did, did the agency consider any other initiatives that would achieve the same goal, getting money into businesses um, that seemed, I know the focus was on the businesses and not on the consumer that was, was receiving the benefit. However, as Mike said, it, it really appeared the other way around to individuals that were looking at it. They weren't thinking so, you know, of, of, they were thinking more of what you know, individuals would receive. But what other initiatives did you consider that didn't make the cut uh, because this appeared like the better approach to getting money directly to businesses to help support them? Sure, well, we did have a competitive RFP process to, to see what programs were out there that we could access. Um, this particular program was the one that was able to get the most amount of direct stimulus to the most amount of businesses. And it was, it was, it was quite obvious there it wasn't really very close in terms of the other alternatives. Some of the other types of programs that we did see um, were, were what we are now seeing, if you may recall, we have addition, an additional grant program, a regional marketing and stimulus grant program where we um, have had an application process for municipalities, um, communities, chambers of commerce to be able to run these types of programs in their own locations. And some of those programs are more like the kind of downtown bucks or, you know, passport programs where you, you, you have a certain amount of purchases and that um, makes you eligible for a, a different incentive or a different discount. Those are some of the other types of programs that we saw for this larger, um, this larger pilot program as well. You know, the, the nice thing is that, you know, since the, the alternative, the regional approach is also happening at the same time, you know, as those programs get underway, we're also going to have the benefit of the experience that they've had for those types of programs. Um, you, know, you know, these things are happening concurrently, so we don't have the benefit of, of the metrics from those other tactics at this very moment. Um, but there are different ways to do this. And, you know, going forward, you know, the state will have that evidence. You know, on the, the piece about the consumers, you know, this was a pilot program. You know, we, we tried to get the word out that, you know, to folks to be excited about it. I, I, I do admit that we could have done a better job um, kind of framing out the expectations. You know, I do understand that um, in terms of making, you know, so, so I, I agree, we did not set the expectations that not everyone would be eligible, uh, or I shouldn't say eligible, but that it wasn't gonna be as easy for everyone to access because anybody was eligible. Um, you know, again, should hindsight 2020 going forward, you know, could we mail these to consumers? Yes, absolutely. You know, there is, they don't have to have, uh, are there ways that we could have addressed that, you know, technological barrier? We had 
thought if it hadn't gone so quickly, we had had brainstormed with some of the capstone agencies in terms of setting up events where folks could either go to the, the local library and sign up that way or just other ways that, you know, we could get over that technological divide. Um, it just would have added more time and expense to the program. And that doesn't mean it's not worth doing, but, you know, we just wanted to, we knew timing was short to kind of see what a tight, what a consumer stimulus program could do. And so that's why uh, we set it up the way we did. Thank you, Heather. Probably going to the library, you wouldn't have many takers with COVID, you know. Yeah. Or, or similar, <laughs> understood. Well, yeah, and I, I did talk to some constituents that that wouldn't go to the library because they don't trust the the um, using library computers um, with their personal information that they might input. So there's that too. Mary? Thank you. I, I These pushy appropriations people coming into your <laughs> committee and asking questions. We're more Thank than you. happy to have you. Yeah. Thank you. Happy Thank you for the welcome. Yeah, um, I appreciate the um, one the the deep need to support, particularly some sectors of our economy and the trouble that they are in. And I I understand the creative thinking that the agency is trying to engage in, to to provide that support to some of those sectors. You, you talked about um, trying to provide economic relief to individual businesses. I am curious about how real that relief is. Um, you gave an example of somebody having received $150 benefit and, and booking four nights of a stay, which clearly is a win for um, that institution for that period of time. But four nights of a stay from one party um, doesn't strike me as being the sort of substantive relief that a business would need to survive. So can you, can you try to flesh out the value of this to the individual businesses in terms of the what sort of difference it's going to make to their bottom line. Yeah, no, I appreciate that question. Um, I would encourage folks who haven't seen the report to read the testimonials that are in the back. We have 10 businesses right there explaining in their own words what this meant to them. And I think it's a, it's a combination. I mean, this is, you know, with the amount of money in this pilot program, this is not the economic assistance that's going to get them from here to next spring. You know, that's really more the amount of money in the economic recovery grants that, that provides that part, that level of financial assistance. But that said, what we've seen from the businesses is that this really was a, a huge boost to their, uh, just a shot in the arm in terms of believing what might be possible that here in one day that they got 15 to 20 new customers is what it was for most businesses who immediately, you know, now knew about their store. The stores we've heard are like, I'm just so thrilled to have these people now, they never would have known I existed. And now I have an opportunity to have them as long-term customers. I can continue speaking to them. And that's really part of the benefit here is it's, it's getting folks to think about their purchasing decisions, to form a relationship with a local business they might not have had before. And that was the reaction that we got from the businesses that they were just so thankful, you know, even for the, even for, so it's only 20 orders and that's not gonna carry them through six months, but it's 20 orders that they didn't have the day before. And it gave them hope that, you know, that there is potential out there for, for residents to support them. Um, and it's a way for them to start, you know, creating a relationship going forward. So what we were really hoping to do was it's, you know, we've really thought about the types of proposals we've put forward is that, you know, what can we to, to do to help that sustain that business, you know, um, in, initially, but then what can we also do to influence purchasing decisions going forward to, to sustain them in the long run? And so this part of the consumer stimulus was really about those consumer decisions, thinking about buying locally, um, and again, what we've seen from the businesses is that maybe it's, you know, the, the $436 is not going to get them through, but the new customers um, and the access they had 
to those customers and what it did for them, even psychologically, was quite beneficial. I, I can appreciate the morale boost that this definitely would have provided and one cannot underestimate the value of that. I think the interesting question for us as legislators is um, weighing the value of that versus the value of cash in the pockets of people who um, are wondering how to pay rent next next week or you know how to put food on the table. Um, and that's that's one of the things that I'm struggling with here. Um, <clears throat> I think, I, I wonder if you cannot accomplish the same, um, if you don't have the ability to drive businesses to business to these businesses through some of the other initiatives that the agency has taken. We, I think we provided what some considered a pretty generous um, uh, amount of money for marketing. Um, and I know you intend to market directly to Vermonters to drive business to these folks. And there may be other tools to accomplish this. Yeah, and in some of the conversations that we had in the Senate where, you know, should we expand this program? You know, how could we think about the population of Vermonters that um, is able to benefit from it as being more um, aligned to, you know, income sensitivity so that we're able to either income sensitivity or circumstances. So, as I said, was it, you know, the population of unemployed was, was where we, we ended up. But to be able to accomplish both. So to be able to give folks who are struggling as the businesses are struggling, you know, this is a way to really tr hopefully identify a, a solution that helps both. You know, this was a, this was a small program. Um, and, and I understand that seeing what this small program could do is definitely instructive to see what would be possible going forward. Um, but we definitely have that ability to tailor, you know, the consumer side of who's eligible based on their needs to help them survive as much as we are for the businesses. Yeah, um, but I think our, our hands are kind of tied on the businesses that we can direct people to because they would have had to have been uh, directly affected by COVID for business revenue loss. And I think the point I think Mary is getting to is that the people that and people that are on UI um, or didn't get into the PUA, whatever reason, um, they probably have more food insecurities um, or needs for um, fuel assistance, things like that. And we we just can't provide it with this with this stimulus money um, because it's got to go to either our lodging businesses or um, our, our restaurant businesses. And I think that's what some of us are struggling with. I mean, that definitely is, you know, one of the trickiest parts of this is that, you know, the CARES Act funding comes with specific guidelines. Um, we felt like that this was a creative approach to be able to accomplish both so that, you know, yes, the money is going to those businesses who have been harmed by this pandemic, but in a way that gives consumers more purchasing power, um, which we can't, directly, you know, give to those folks. So that that was really, that was our intent of, of pursuing this. Jean. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, two questions. Um, one is if, if you could, where would you improve the program? But the other question I really have is, I'm wondering, since you have it up and running now, and we have the deadline of 1230 of, of, and the state really wants to see the money by 1220. I'm wondering whether this program would be a good catch all for any unexpended funds that come back to us in December. Could you, could, you know, would, would not, I hate to have it go back to the feds and you've got everything going and would that be, would that be an opportunity to just literally sweep cash into this program because then it's discretionary Christmas spending. I and mean, you could figure out how you allocate it, but if we can't get it out the door any other way, can it on December 1st, could you be able to get this thing going? We certainly, we certainly could. I think that in terms of kind of both parts of your questions, I think in terms of lessons learned, um, 
So on one hand, yes, the program is up and running and we could put more money into it and we could give discounts to folks tomorrow. So we can do that very quickly. The, the second half of that is we could only do that very quickly for the folks that have already signed up for the program. You know, and we have heard again in lessons learned, like, you know, could we either change that population of people or, or expand it? So I think that if we were going to do something like that and open it up, you know, near the end of the program, we would just want to kind of talk through who would be eligible for that extra spending money for the holidays. And if we wanted to enroll them pre, you know, sooner to get as many people involved in that, I wouldn't want to set false expectations to get more people to sign up for the program in the hopes that they would benefit, you know, with that very small tail right. at the end, not knowing how much we had. So I, I mean, I love that idea. Yes, we could, this program could be expanded very easily. It, we could change the parameters, you know, depending on which ones they are, some are easier than others, but we can make all those changes. Um, it's just a question of, you know, that the, the population yeah. of folks who could benefit from it and, and how quickly we could get that many more people enrolled, especially if we want to offer, let's say, you know, a mail-in option and that type of thing. Thank you. I, I just, I'm long, I'm glad to hear that because I, it would kill me to give the feds any money back. It would just break my heart. So it's nice to know that that, might, that option might be out there. Thank you. You're welcome. Kitty? Uh, thanks, Mike. Is there another hand, though, before me? I don't want to. No. Yeah. I, I just, um, and Heather, I really appreciate your comments. It, it's bringing a lot of clarity to the program. You mentioned about the testimonials at the end that I think you said that there were 10. Knowing that there were over a thousand businesses that were queued up um, in, in this, in, in this uh, initiative, did you hear or learn from any of the businesses that didn't feel it was successful, what could be done differently and why they didn't feel it was successful? Yeah, I mean, most of the businesses that we've heard who have, um, you know, I guess I would put that in uh, kind of a cons uh, customer service bucket, you know, who had uh, issues. You know, most of what we saw, well, there was some confusion about how to redeem it. Um, those, as far as I know, have all been resolved. Um, so if, if any came to us, you know, we were able to pass it on to the, you know, to the folks implementing the program and those were resolved. Um, you know, I, I think that there were some businesses who thought they might get more um, out of this. And, you know, so that's a little bit about expectations and there is an element of consumer choice. So that, you know, even though 93% of the businesses who were up and running, you know, with the program, when this happened, there were 7% who didn't get any business from that. And so, you know, we have heard from a few folks um, who, who didn't receive it because, you know, there is an element of, of consumer choice in there. So, you know, um, the other part of the program that we have built in that we don't have, and I can't report on this right this second, but we have we had it set to go out for you know in three weeks to do a full feedback loop in terms of how merchants are feeling about the program to make sure that we're capturing that type of, of feedback you know not waiting for someone to volunteer because yes usually you hear the the good stories or you know you hear the outliers let's say um, when people volunteer that feedback but that is part of the program that we had set up was to have uh, feedback from businesses as to you know what they felt about it and. Um, you know, again, and, and and as well as the ongoing, are they getting repeat visits in in terms of, you know, what the, the multiplying effect is on top of just the initial redemption? Thank yeah, thank you. Heather, I'm wondering, because in the different division of ACCD, they've had to calculate as to how many potential affected businesses there are in this universe that could participate. Um, so I don't know if you're working with that same kind of understanding as if you've got a thousand that signed up before the program went live, and then you have another 500 applications or whatever for businesses. Uh, what do you have an idea of what percentage that is of the total businesses that could apply based on how ACCD has looked at that universe of businesses in the state? I don't have that number off the top of my head. I'm sorry. I, I could definitely ask. Okay. I'm just wondering. Um, because I know in estimating as to how much grant money would be needed to be available and the, anticipating that uh, was trying to figure that out as well. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any more questions for Heather?
Mary? Sorry, I'm struggling to raise my hand to find the bar to raise my oh. hand. Um, <laughs> um, the current pro program or the, the pilot project um, took 15% uh, administrative overhead. Uh, will, would that be the case going forward? I would highly doubt that. Um, you know, if this program were to be ex expanded, we would ask for an, an additional, you know, proposal as to what the administration's cost would be. Um, I would hope that we would get that down to, you know, spitballing, but less than 5%. I certainly would not expect it to be that high. The, the program is already set up. Um, so there, you know, depending on how much we changed it, you know, there might be, um, depending on how much we changed it, I think that would influence, you know, if there was additional development costs involved. Um, but I would expect it to be much lower than that. Yeah, thank you. That, that's excellent to hear. I, uh, some of us were rather aghast at the administrative costs um, and also that those funds went to an out of state entity to manage the program. Um, we, you know, any way we can figure out how to keep money in Vermont is really to be looked at. Thanks. I do understand that that, that has been frustrating. It, you know, the administrative costs were, you know, one of the major factors as to why we made the decision of the vendor that we did is that the administration administrative costs were much higher for the other proposals that yeah. we used. I'm in the wrong business, clearly. <laughs> Thanks. Any more questions for Heather? Stephanie. Heather, that lower rate, um, uh, the, the lower commission that uh, NIFT would, would charge for the, uh, if, if this was to go forward, was that in the original proposal? No, I'm that's that is my guess. So that you know, if that was something that needed to be um, established before the program was expanded, we could certainly do that. Um, I'm just knowing that the if we're talking about the kind of money we're talking about, you know, we would expect to have huge amounts of economies of scale. And have they done that in other uh, regions where they've run these sort of NIFT NIFT uh, card programs? I don't have that information as to what the, the costs were in, in other programs. All right, so, so you're sort of guessing that they're gonna re reduce it to a 5% commission? That's, a, a yes, I, that's a, my best estimate as, as to what I think at this moment. Um, as I said, if, if, this is, if that's the part of the decision-making that needs to be established before you know, there was any thoughts about going forward, we could certainly do that. More questions? Okay. Heather, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for the report. We appreciate it. I think it brings a lot more clarity to what's happening. Charlie, go ahead. Sorry, I just had this thought and I've been thinking about it since it's already set up, Heather, and you know that our recommendation was not to include any funds for this particular continuation of the program. But because it's already set up, could you envision a situation in which the participating businesses would help support that program because of its marketing value? So if this was run as a private um, venture, that offered the matchmaking between consumers coming in and also the businesses that would be participating. Is that of value to the businesses that would participate in the potential consumers if they offered the discounts, um, but there would have to be some kind of purchase? Yeah, there's definitely that possibility that if businesses you know, liked this mechanism that they could decide on their own to go forward with it. Um, I'm less familiar with exactly how that works, but it's my understanding that yes, private businesses can utilize this type of program on their own um, if it was if if they, either they wanted to fund it or it was funded a different way. So in that sense, I mean, you could almost say that it's seed money. Um, 
if the if the structure has been set up and the system is put in place, you, you could think of it that way, that the state has created this tool. Um, anyway, just a thought as to what that looks like down the road. Yeah. Well, I, I did want to just, you know, chair, thank you for the opportunity to come in here. I know that, you know, last time I was in the committee, you know, we the, the program hadn't launched. And so it was a lot of it in theory. Um, and so I, I really do appreciate the opportunity to come back and to present the report and to answer questions um, so that, you know, I could just clear up any, if there were misunderstandings or, you know, obviously report on the results. So I just wanted to, to acknowledge that I appreciate the time. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, we're glad you were you were able to join us. I think it's very helpful. We appreciate it. And uh, do want to thank our our friends from Appropriations for coming and joining us today too. It's always good to have you with us. Always good to either join you or you join us. Um, <clears throat> so if there's nothing else for Heather, I think our work is completed for today uh, as far as committee goes. And so uh, again, appreciate everyone I appreciate the committee and appreciate uh, members from from appropriations chair toll vice chair hooper and represent myers for joining us um and especially represent myers for sticking around with us for i don't know how, how many how many committee meetings but we do appreciate all your work and thank you committee um just a reminder we're on the floor again at two today and uh, we're back here uh, and committee at 10.30 tomorrow morning. And uh, tomorrow we'll be looking at uh, unemployment, the unemployment trust fund, and looking at what we can do um, to alleviate penalty weeks for people that are serving those so that at least during the pandemic, they can um, receive unemployment to um, feed themselves and their family. So with that, Amy, I think we can...